Hello, and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 19, titled Payback. It originally premiered on March 14th, 1986. The writer was Robert Crace. Crace, I think is how you say it. He will write another episode in the future under a pseudonym. So I don't know why he doesn't put his name on the other work that will come up in the future on Miami Vice. <laughs> Maybe that's a bad sign. Because that, ep- because that episode was terrible. <laughs> The director is Aaron Libstadt, who also directed Yankee Dollar and then has another episode coming up uh, called El Viejo. So one of our guest stars, Dan Hedaya, he gets a uh, director's credit in this one. Oh, interesting. I wonder if Aaron Libstadt is a pseudonym then. Or, I mean, that that you can obviously have multiple directors, but I wonder if... I got to look up now if Aaron Libstadt is a a pseudonym and maybe Dan Hedaya does... Three episodes. It could very well be. Yeah. You know, <laughs> or they just promised him a director's credit because he was like, what do you mean I'm playing a different character? <laughs> yeah, I know. That makes no sense. <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And, you know, we haven't talked about the weather much. We live in very different areas. Seattle for John, Phoenix for me and Melissa. It's, you know, it's been, it got hot for a few days. There was in the hundreds. We had 108 a couple days ago, but it's been in the low 80s, high 70s, pretty consistently. It's actually been a really great spring. We haven't been punished too bad here in Phoenix. John, what's the weather been like in Seattle? (laughs) We (laughs) had (laughs) basically the the West Coast, uh, Washington equivalent of a hurricane roll through. (laughs) Uh, So it was high humidity, mid to high 70s, lowly as hell. Uh, basically, the the five mile path thunderstorm rolled through at about 50 miles an hour. The storm <laughs> itself, not including the winds that came with it, basically leveled any gigantic tree it could. So I have actually I have a picture of a Rite Aid parking lot where every single tree. And these are 30, 40 foot trees in their parking lot. Every single tree is knocked over the same direction. Wow! Wow! Hey, you know, Melissa, guess what we don't have to deal with anymore? That weather? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but we have to deal with melting, though. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Well, speaking of stormy weather, let's go talk about this episode because Crockett is a real mopey, grumpy guy throughout this entire episode. So let's go break down this episode. So when we open up, I actually really like this open because it was the the Jan Hammer music is pounding in the background. It's actually kind of an artsy open. There's a lot of uh, wide angle shots, very white, big color contrasts that are happening as Crockett heads out to this prison to go talk to a man named Morata or Mar- Maroto. That's what his name is. Maroto, who is played by the great Roberto Duran, the boxer with 103 wins. Roberto Duran. And amazing hair, by the way. <laughs> it was like a helmet, a shellacked helmet or something. <laughs> yes, Roberto Duran, who won his first title as a WBA lightweight in 72. He ended up winning five titles before he retired in 2001 after a near-fatal car crash. Yeah, so he um, wasn't even probably, done. He could have kept fighting no. if it wasn't for the car crash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, dude, he like he retired in '98, and then he came back out of retirement, fought until 2001, and it took a car crash to make him finally call it quit. I think the most notable fight for him would be his bouts with Sugar Ray Leonard. Beat Sugar Ray Leonard in 1980 to win the title, only to lose to him several months later in a rematch. And I would say those so. fights, those fights, the. Duran versus Leonard. Uh, other than Mike Tyson, those fights defined boxing in the eighties. Oh yeah, the the second fight, the rematch fight versus Leonard is very well known. If you've ever watched any sports boxing highlights, it's the uh, No Moss fight where mm-hmm. Duran just refused to come out of his corner late mm-hmm. in the fight because he 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 had had enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, he in this episode doesn't live up to that because he only lasts for about three minutes. Crockett comes in. He sees Marado, asks him to come out there. He says that he has something to tell him. There's this pounding music scene where the two come walking into a room. Crockett's very upset. He's like, I drove 70 miles to get here. What 
what do you have to tell me? Marados. Andy walked like five miles through the prison. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Marado stands up, grabs Crockett by the face, gives him the kiss to death, and then pulls a handmade gun out of his belt. Like it's actually, I, I, it's I want to applaud him for making that. It's pretty in, ingenious. Yeah, I know. At first, I didn't know it was a gun when I first watched <laughs> that episode. I'm like, okay, so what does he have? It looked like the thing you use to check the pressure on your tire. <laughs> He's got an air gauge. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't know what that is. <laughs> oh my god, it's a gun. Yeah, see, I, I'm I'm with you, Melissa. I didn't know what it was first. I'm thinking like, wow, uh, you know, he's got some soft lips. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he just kissed him. And then he pulls that thing out. He kills himself, and the scene ends. And I'm like, did, did he blow himself up? Like, yeah, what exactly happened. They don't show it. <laughs> you don't really show that part. So that means so we start this episode the same way the last one ended with Crockett witnessing a suicide. I'm just curious how much Duran got paid for his total of 30 seconds in this episode. <laughs> well, he does say when he grabs Crockett by the face, he sa- he says. It takes one tough cop to catch me. Now we'll just see how tough you are. Payback. And then he pulls the trigger and he kills himself. And then we go to the opening credits, so that, which that's going to be really important near the end of the episode on that Marado promise that he was going to get payback on Crockett. When we come back from the opening credits, we see a woman come walking into the Miami Dade police headquarters and and she was dressed like a banana kind of she looks like a big banana walking into that <laughs> sorry that's funny <laughs> she is because she's really tall and thin and she just wears all she's yellow wearing that yellow dress yeah, yeah she's wearing that yellow dress she's so, like yeah. the woman in the yellow hat like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, she's a where's the monkey <laughs> yeah. and she looks like I was a housewife wondering, right? like, like, <laughs> yeah yeah I was wondering like when did Crockett start banging PTA moms yeah exactly Yeah. <laughs> she comes in and asks for Sonny Crockett has to leave a message she's out on assignment another really short scene and we'll see this a, bu- a bunch of times where she's like making phone calls throughout the episode uh, looking for someone named Crockett uh, they're all really short, but at the end of the episode, it becomes re- really important when you figure out who she is. After we leave the precinct, we're heading out to this gigantic house. I have to say right now, I, I, I really liked this episode, and it was mostly because it fit everything that Miami Vice does well. The high life, high culture, high fashion, and then the drugs, obviously, like because it's a, it's a cop show, but... They're heading out to this gigantic house. They're on Crockett's really nice speedboat, and everyone's in suits looking great. And then there's a conversation on the boat with Tubbs and Crockett where Tubbs is just saying, hey, the guy was crazy. And Crockett tells a story about how he busted him after getting information from Joe Paluca. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Blow. On a five kilo crack deal. Tubbs asks, like, it's kind of weird that he committed suicide after 14 months of an eight year bit. And he just decides to pull his brains out. I don't know. It doesn't seem like that's that that confusing. Why he would do that if someone's in prison? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, not he exactly. He was barely the, into it. Like, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, or, 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 I thought they were trying to say he was going to get out in fourteen months. Uh, no, I think he had been in there for fourteen months, and that's when he decided to all of a sudden oh, okay. do that. See, I didn't understand that. I thought when I watched it that he was it saying that he had fourteen yeah. months left. So that's why it's so shocking. Mm, that like, could why be. would you kill yourself yeah. when you had you you're fourteen months in, and it's been a really long time since Crockett had seen him? Right? Because mm-hmm. fourteen mm-hmm. months would be like. He was working with Tubbs practically. That's true. Yep, that's true. So I think it was that he had 14 months left and it made no sense at all for him to kill himself then. Yeah, and Crockett's really jumpy. He's like this throughout the whole episode. He's really jumpy. He's always looking over his shoulder. He's really edgy. He's constantly thinking that someone's out to get him after seeing the suicide. So he's, and it weighs on his personality throughout the whole episode. Yeah, but he's not mopey, okay? (laughs) (laughs) He's legitimately worried for his safety, not mopey. There's a difference. (laughs) They're heading out to this house, and they're going to see someone named Ray Dolfo. And this is, all of this is fantastic. (laughs) He's the partner of Mario Fuente. They're using Rodolfo to get to Mario. So when they get off the boat and they go see Rodolfo, it's Rodolfo is being played by Dan Hedea, who we've seen in a previous episode where he's an internal affairs officer and now he's is he Cuban? Is he some sort know. of Latin, right? I think he might be Cuban because when spoiler, when Tubbs is Cuban, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> can't even keep a straight face. When Tubbs tries to be Cuban, tries, uh, he he like relates with him. So I think that's why Tubbs went Cuban instead mm-hmm. of Jamaican. <laughs> 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 I just like the joke he throws out there. So they come up on the beach and he's standing next to a hammerhead shark that he just caught. And Crockett goes, 
what did you use for bait? And Had- Hadaya, in that terrible accent, goes, an illegal alien. <laughs> well, Tubbs isn't helping much because, as you mentioned, Melissa, he's doing that Cuban accent, which he doesn't even stick with because later in the episode, he switches back to Jamaican. I don't know what was going on. He was like delusional that he could pull those off. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe he's confused about where Jamaica and Cuba are. <laughs> he thinks they're one and the same. <laughs> <laughs> Their whole point of dealing with Rodolfo is they're going to set up these really big buys, like 70, 100 kilos at a time. And then, but they want to go talk to Fuente. They want to do business straight with Fuente, but they can't get through Ray Dolfo. He's putting up too much of a stone wall. When we leave from Ray Dolfo's house, we head over to the precinct. And this is, again, like the woman who calls all the time. Gina keeps delivering the messages from Miami-Dade headquarters that there was these messages left for Sonny, but he's not answering them. He's just taking them and throwing them away, basically. Castillo pulls the duo into his office and he, and he introduces two DEA agents from New Orleans. I only caught one of their names, which is the guy that's in the in the enti- entire episode. His name is Kate, but I didn't catch the other guy's name. I didn't catch his name either. I just call him, no. <laughs> I had my own name for him, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> I did not like him. Castillo says that these guys are going to be working with them through the investigation because they know they have some information on Fuente, too. Crockett says, yeah, no thanks. And Castillo says, it's, tough shit. Yeah, it's not like, like a request. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's you're going to do it. <laughs> Dad is mad. You have to I do wrote it. it a little different in my notes, but we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Castillo's not happy about it either. No, he isn't, for the record. He's not happy, but he's just, he, you know him, he's just doing what he has to do for procedural. Mm-hmm. He has to do that that way. So when we leave from the precinct, we head over to Club Frankie and Johnny's. And the duo are out, and they're going to, what's happening is is that Kate's is setting up, Kate's is setting up the deal with Rodolfo. He's got some sort of in with Rodolfo. He's been working with him for a while already. So mm-hmm. he's got like a, a foot in the door. Yeah. So he's supposed to be the middleman between them to like, because he didn't like, you should go over that the Rodolfo didn't like them. And mm-hmm. He didn't want to work with them. He thought mm-hmm. they were pushy. Mm-hmm. And so it wasn't, if it wasn't for Kate's, like they weren't going to get in basically. So that's why. So they're there as Cooper and Burnett. And this is where Tub switches back to Jamaican. <laughs> too <laughs> see i think tubbs only does the jamaican ab- accent when he's drunk because they're hanging out at the <laughs> bar and they're having a few drinks yeah he brought he out suddenly the jamaican. switches a jamaican yeah i think that <laughs> mm-hmm. the jamaican thing was just for crockett's sake he was like joking around so he brought out the jamaican but maybe the jamaican <laughs> makes crockett happy i don't know <laughs> we don't I- crockett let me give you a little jamaican <laughs> You know, I'm a little bit ahead of myself because this is the scene, talk about a bar scene that's going to come up. That's at the restaurant the next day. the restaurant that was, yeah. Right now at Frankie and Johnny's, this is where Kate comes and says he's happy to be working with Sonny. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And Sonny's being real mopey about how it went down, like all the stuff that he's dealt with in the last few days. And he says, hey, by the way, I got to go. And he leads his penis over to the (laughs) bar and he goes and talks to some women. (laughs) Like a lightning rod. (laughs) When we leave from the club, we see the woman again. And now she's going through the phone book and she's calling every person with the last name Crockett in the phone book. Just going one by one through the entire book. I mean, I guess if she had the internet, that would have been a lot faster back then. <laughs> like she was literally going through the phone book and making uh, her payphone. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Quarter in, <laughs> dial. Nope, not him. If the internet existed back then, every drug dealer search would have been our Cooper and <laughs> Crockett the same person. <laughs> yeah, Crockett would have had to come up uh-huh. with a better name. <laughs> Is Tubbs uh-huh. really Jamaican? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sonny, he's heading over to his boat. And he's got some bimbo with him that he's yeah. taking back to the boat. And then he can hear music playing as he's walking up. So he tells her to stay. I'm going to go investigate this. Just be calm. Runs over there and pulls his gun out. <laughs> yeah. I don't even think she knew he was a cop either. So she's like, great. I wanted, I'm, I was going to go home and sleep with some guy who was going to shoot me or something. <laughs> hey, John, I have a question. Why, why does Sonny's boat get attacked if he's got a guard alligator? What is Elvis up to? Yeah, exactly. Where is Elvis I- even in that scene? He's looking around. Crockett's re- looking around, pointing his gun everywhere. Elvis is nowhere to be seen. And my first thought was, someone stole his his alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis would have went willingly. They had like a bowl of dog food. Come on, Elvis, let's go. <laughs> Maybe Elvis is he a had free his own range friend. alligator. Is, yeah, I know. <laughs> he is, leaves is at that, night and then comes back just gonna, on the boat. <laughs> 
Crockett works around in his boat with his gun out. There's no one there. He has to tell the bimbo to stay out of the boat because he tries to get in it, <laughs> even after all that. And he notices that <laughs> written on a board after he turns the music off, there's someone had scrawled on the table that says, where's the money, Crockett? And then he erases it. What kind of cop is he that erases evidence? I don't know. Not Well, we already, we have already talked about this, okay? He does things his own way. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> fingerprints apparently were not a problem either, right? Because he could have just got fingerprints from that. No, he That's totally what erases saying. it. That's what I'm saying. So why did he erase it? <laughs> <laughs> apparently, his date doesn't stay the night because he wakes up the next morning and he's just there by himself. The phone rings and there's a man on the other end of the line that just says, share the well, and then hangs up. And then a few minutes later, Tubbs comes knocking because, you know, Tubbs, he's up at 5 a.m., suit on, out getting shit done. I'm yeah. like, Crockett's sleeping in exactly. late. Exactly. <laughs> so Crockett comes home. His boat's been vandalized. His alligator's gone. He just passes out, wakes up the next <laughs> morning, morning all hung over, <laughs> like nothing happened. <laughs> at first, Crockett, he's jumpy. He just jumps up and grabs his gun, points at Tubbs. Tubbs. Talks him down. Because <laughs> he still wants to shoot him, even though he knows it's him. No? <laughs> You've been through this many times, Crockett. If I come knocking, don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is a common plot point in a yeah, Miami exactly. Vice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It tells us, like, man, you're supposed to leave a sock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> and then Crockett goes into this rant about how he's been working Vice longer than Tubbs has been, like when he was still pounding the pavement and he knows what he's doing. Get up, Leave me alone. You can't well, tell me what to do kind of rant. Well, the thing is, is that Crockett and the conversation between Crockett and Tubbs is about the fact that people, someone has figured out that Crockett, spoiler, is Bar- Barnett. <laughs> and he's all upset. It? <laughs> he's all upset because his secret identity has been compromised. And I love Tubbs' <laughs> suggestion. He basically says, like, well, I guess you need a new boat. <laughs> like, that's going to fix it. Not a new name. You notice he doesn't say you need a new, like, identity. Mm-hmm. And you will and you will see as things go on in the show, he doesn't change his name from, <laughs> from Burnett. <laughs> By the way, at, at this point, is it a surprise that someone has figured out that Crockett is Barnett? No, because he uses the same name every freaking investigation. And those people get arrested <laughs> and then they go to jail and talk to each other. You, you also don't go to jail for the rest of your life for drug offenses. No, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the conversation is interrupted because Kate calls and says that he's got the meeting set up with Ray Dolfo. So that's where they head over to, to the restaurant. When they come to it, Thompson and Crockett are sitting at a little tiny table. Crockett's really jumpy, real grumpy. That's what I'm saying. He's he's kind of mopey in this episode. Well, he's grumpy in this scene because he doesn't like the table that the waitress set him at. Like, it's her fault that he <laughs> got his boat vandalized and lost his alligator. <laughs> I didn't get that vibe that Crockett was any different because Crockett's usually a dick to waitresses and women, <laughs> working women. So, like, I wasn't surprised. Like, oh, he's just being a dick to the waitress again. John's just still bitter about the whole Trudy incident from last episode. <laughs> <laughs> she had all those files and you didn't even want them <laughs> hey just wait we're gonna talk about trudy again <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> it's coming <laughs> so what happens here is that kate's is able to set up with radolfo he vouches for burnett and cooper that these guys know what they're doing they are going to set up a big buy and then they're actually going to get to be able to meet fuente so kate's has done his job he has come in from new orleans quote unquote new orleans he's come in Introduce them to Fuente, to Ray Ray Dolfo, because he's in close with him. And now they're going to get a chance to meet Fuente. I want to point out right now, and this is going to be something I'm going to talk about a couple times here in the episode. They say that 100 kilos is too small. 100 kilos, translating to us Americans, is 220 pounds. (laughs) (laughs) They must deal in quarter ton blocks, which is 500 pounds. Now, just remember that, because we're going to talk about this math. Uh, a little bit later in the episode. <laughs> a little fuzzy math. <laughs> At the precinct later, Sonny is still going on. He's like, I don't know what the deal is with Kate's. Why Why all of a sudden he just came in and he's able to crack open this Fuente case right away. He thinks something's fishy. Tubbs turns to Zito to ask him, like, hey, so what are your thoughts? And Zito just goes, sorry, Tubbs, I, 
I'm broke until payday. Tubbs is all, is he always hit up the office people for money? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, you never you never see where Tubbs lives. True. No, like literally, I'm not kidding. Through the entire uh, the entire run of the show, you will never see Tubbs' apartment. Wow. Like maybe maybe in the last season, maybe like maybe when he's sleeping with some bimbo or something, and brings her back there. But <laughs> but no, really, you don't you ever go to his place. You go to Zito. You go to Zwitek. You go to Trudy. You go to Gina, but you never go to. I don't even think he. Maybe he lives in his car. Like maybe he's sleeping <laughs> at the precinct. I don't know. <laughs> well, seeing later with Castillo, I think a lot of people just live at the precinct. Leave Castillo alone. He's a lonely man. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's hard to be a samurai and no one wants you. <laughs> Gina delivers some more messages from Miami Dade. Because apparently she's a secretary now. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> Trudy's busy being a good she- cop. Someone's got to fill that yeah. role. <laughs> but you didn't talk about Zito in the best part of his uh- answer. Remember they asked him why why do you think he was able to break this and he said that the best part that best part of the whole show for me was him and his answer. <laughs> he said that it's like a jar, like a pickle jar you try to open and you guys were just twisted and twisted on the top and you couldn't get it and just did that one last twist and it popped right open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Poor Vito. He has a lot of pickle jars at home he can't open. Wholesome wisdom from from yes. Zito. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so then Castillo comes out and he pulls Crockett into his office and he tells Sonny that IA wants to see him right away. And this is where we head to a very weird scene in this episode where Crockett goes over to see the I he goes over to see internal affairs. He comes in this room, he's just pacing around, he's really sweaty, he's complaining about how hot it is, then he looks at the temperature, keeps looking at his watch. He there's another man in there who's not saying anything. So apparently there must only be one magazine <laughs> in the waiting room. Maybe that guy brought his own. He probably thought ahead. <laughs> See, I hate this. I hate when you go into the waiting room and someone's already filled out the uh, what is that family circle or whatever that <laughs> yeah that that magazine that's in every dentist's office and someone's already figured out all the maze and highlights. All that's the what you're talking about. Word jumbles. Highlights. Yeah. One. <laughs> Highlights. Highlights. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Drives me nuts. Like, don't, don't, don't fill it out. Like, leave it for other people. I want to do the highlight stuff too. (laughs) Sonny eventually snaps. He yells at the other man, Why aren't you sweating? The man turns to him and says, I don't have a reason to sweat. Maybe you do. And then Sonny says, I'm done playing this game and storms out. And that's like, so what kind of IA investigation is I this? I don't know. And why was he mad at that guy? That guy has nothing to do with it. He was just waiting in there. I, I mean, mean, I guess guy... they're supposed to insinuate it's like that was part of the IA investigation. Oh, guess maybe that guy was there on purpose to sweat him out and yeah. make him nervous and just sit there and look at the magazine. <laughs> but then they just let him leave. I don't know. But that guy was wearing the ugliest shirt that's ever been made. <laughs> that brown and like floral number. That was awful. <laughs> <laughs> I- I'm just curious. Does does doing Sudoku keep you cool? Like, is that why he wasn't sweating? Yeah, maybe. I don't get the not sweating part. Yeah, because either way, it's hot no matter what. It's, it's Miami. We know it's hot. <laughs> yeah, it's Miami. It's hot no matter what. And I mean, I don't think Crockett has anything to feel guilty about. No. Um, yeah. So, no, so why would later. he be sweating? Yeah, yeah. yeah unless he's hot. <laughs> <laughs> later at the precinct, just the whole team's come together. They're going to go make this buy with Fuente. Kate says he's out. He's done everything he was supposed to do. They don't need him out on the bus. He's not the Miami Vice. He was just there to help get 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 them in connection with them. Then we jump to a fast scene for the that same woman who's been making all the phone calls. She says she calls someone and says, "I figured out who Officer Crockett is." Hangs up the phone, and that's where all of this is going to come together. Because now we're going to head out to Fuente's boat. The duo are heading out there on Sunny's boat. It's a, they're heading out to this. It's a huge yacht. There's armored guards. Ray Dolfo's there. Fuente and that woman that's been making the phone calls is there too. And then Fuente comes down and starts to tell a story to Sunny. They they pat them down. They they take their guns. So the duo are there without any protection. It's just those, just them two out on that yacht with surrounded by armed guards. And Fuente goes into so the story. In, it is, it is important to out right now that Fuente is Frank Zappa. Yes. So Frank Zappa, a brilliant musician, filmmaker, composer, and producer, one of the most underrated guitarists of all time. By the way, he can play both left and righty, oh, or could. He, most of his music was like satire and novelty songs that he did with his band, The Mothers, or Mothers of Invention. But, I mean, between stuff that he produced and, and the influence he had on the music industry, Frank Zappa is just a, a heavy hitter when it comes to music. But my favorite part about Frank Zappa 
Kappa are the names of his children. <laughs> we have Moonunit, his oldest daughter. We have Dweezel. We have Amet, Amuka, Rodan. <laughs> and then probably my favorite, Diva Thin Muffin Pigeon. <laughs> what? <laughs> Okay. Yes. I only knew of Dweezil because he was on Roseanne, like ah. a, a guest star thing. It's, it's hard to forget someone named Moon Unit. Yeah, Moon Unit, too. Yeah, I did know that one, but I'd never seen that one, that, that daughter. <laughs> He's actually yeah, I, I, really good I was good aware of Moon Unit and Dweezil. Yeah, and I, and I was aware of Moon Unit and Dweezil because they've actually done stuff in media. Uh, like, Moon Unit's done songs and acting and stuff. It was Diva Thin, uh, Thin Muffin. That caught me off guard. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so. <laughs> thin <mint. laughs> I don't know if Thin Muffin's even any better than Thin Mint. No, it's so, not, but it's really um, funny. So, so one I wanted to out that I thought was a big deal about this episode was that Frank Zappa died of prostate cancer in 1993. He was diagnosed in 1990. And when he was diagnosed, they said that it had gone undiagnosed or untreated for about 10 years oh wow which means that at the point of this episode he technically had prostate cancer but didn't know it that's insane that for 10 years like the estimated you know who knows how long it actually was but that the estimated yeah. time range could have been up to 10 years that he didn't know and he's just out there getting shit done yeah living yeah, in life. Yeah. yeah so the article uh, or the thing i read said that it was likely contributed to what his father did his father worked uh, as a defense contractor mm. working at proving grounds and so he was exposed to like trace amounts of like mustard gas and stuff that his dad used to work with and so he mm -hmm. was actually really sickly as a child his dad actually up moved the whole family because of it so wow but I, I did think that was in interesting that he was probably sick it, while filming the episode. Wow. I mean, to Frank Zappa's credit, I'm not one for his music. I don't, I'm, I don't enjoy his music that much. But the things that I've seen him in acting, including this episode, he was really good. Like, he was really good in this episode. Even yeah, he was. For as yeah. little he's in it, he's really good. Yeah, he makes an impact in mm -hmm. it. Like, even mm -hmm. though he's only in it for a couple scenes here and there. This is when Fuente comes down and gives his speech about how he's figured out Burnett and Crockett are the same person. He says that he used to have a trusted partner named Marado, and that Marado, after being arrested and had been in prison, called a certain police officer named Sonny Crockett, and then Marado ended up dead, and he's still looking for the $3 million that Marado made off with. And so when he started to... Then suddenly, mysteriously, this up-and-coming two-bit drug dealer named Burnett started dealing in quantities that were kind of strange to Fuente that he started to investigate and they figured out that Burnett and Crockett are the same person. And now he wants Crockett because he feels that Crockett knows where the money is. He wants Crockett to give him the $3 million that Murado stole from him years ago. There's two things I want to point out about this. So one thing is Fuente hangs out on this yacht, basically just out in international waters. So he can't be touched for the crap mm -hmm. he does, right? So technically... He's breaking the law in international waters, which would make him a pirate. <laughs> yes. There is an actual episode where they talk about the pirate thing. Mm -hmm. There's an episode further on. Maybe that maybe that is a continuation. I can't remember, but it's like a pirate. It's it's called Pirate something. Oh, okay. Pirate Bay or I don't know, something like that. But it is. And they talk about that. The people that, that are out in the water. Out in that, in yeah. That part of the water. Interesting. Uh, I wanted to point out that he is a pirate. <laughs> and I also wanted to point out that he keeps referring to cocaine as weasel dust. <laughs> I think Frank Zappa made that up on his own. He was like, I want to call it weasel dust. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. Do whatever you want. <laughs> that's, that's my contribution. <laughs> and then this is when the miracle happens. Because the duo decide to punch their way out, grab guns, take, take Fuente prisoner, get on the boat, and then get about 100 yards away from the yacht, dump Fuente in the ocean, and drive away. Don't ask me how. So, <laughs> I know. So, let, let, Let's go back. So now Crockett and Tubbs have killed people and kidnapped Fuente. Technically, they can't prove anything against. So technically, Crockett and Tubbs are now pirates, too. <laughs> exactly. Because they get him on the boat and then he says, you guys can't arrest me. So what are you going to do with me? And they're like, well, he's like, you can't kill me. You're not going to kill me, basically. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and then 
Crockett's like, well, you know what? Or Tubbs goes, he's right. We can't take him in. And Crockett goes, yeah, but we don't have to take him back with us. And he dumps him in the water. <laughs> yeah. So do you think they have to fill out paperwork on those people they killed on that boat before nah, they got out of there? Just, they just chalk it up to a day's work. <laughs> they don't even think that Castillo knows they killed those people. <laughs> it's like, whatever. <laughs> also, Technically, when he jumped, they're in international waters. Pirates do what pirates do. Exactly. You know? <laughs> well, I don't know um, about Frank Zappa being a pirate because before he jumps in the water, he plugs his nose, which I thought was really great. He's like, fine. I have to swim. I'll go. And he, he looks very smug and plugs his nose and then jumps in the water and swims away. <laughs> Let, let's get to the math side of this. Frank Zappa or Fuente is accusing Crockett and or Barnett, the pirate, of stealing $3 million. So let's get into the math of this. <laughs> so in 1981, a kilo of cocaine uh, in Bogota, Colombia, was about $20,000. By the time that made it to the U.S., it would be equal to about $60,000. Yeah, so, and they sell, uh, we hear them constantly say kilos. There, people are selling kilos somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $50,000 a kilo. Those are numbers that we see in the episodes. Yes. So... They are essentially after Barnett for $3 million, which is equal to a roughly 50 kilos, or if we go with the lower cost, the 20 to 25,000, then essentially 150 kilos. Let's go back to the fact that 100 kilos was too small to deal with Fuente. And they had <laughs> to deal in quarter ton blocks because yeah. that's typically what he sold. Um, I'm having a problem here, guys. <laughs> I just envisioned that why, John. Why does a he board. care about three million dollars? <laughs> John, do you have a board at home that you drew this out on? <laughs> Is there like red string attaching all these <laughs> these numbers together with pins? <laughs> Sketching there is. You drew. There is. I, I, I even hired a detective. <laughs> He's got a giant ass calculator in there. Like, that. Well, I mean, you're right, John. He 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 says he doesn't deal in 100 kilo units. It's too small. So like, so basically, that means that three million dollars is nothing to him. It's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> it's the principle okay it's the principle someone took his money so after this amazing yacht scene which is which we have talked a lot about now because there's just so many great things including the miracle on yacht escape that they get to get out, that they do to get they out just of there punch their way out of it, it must have been stormtroopers as guards <laughs> around that boat yeah i know <laughs> we're over at the precinct and castillo crockett kate's and the other guy are all in a meeting together. We this call him Jerkface. <laughs> <laughs> so this is when we find out that Jerkface <laughs> is actually an, a member of Internal Affairs. And he's there investigating Sonny Crockett. The other guy is a DEA agent, Cates. And he has worked with Ray Dolfo and with Fuente. So that, that part is true. And he's also a snitch then. Because yeah, he was... but he decided to help <laughs> yeah. with this IA investigation mm -hmm. into yep. Sonny. And they have reason to be suspicious. His meeting with Morado, that Morado died, that Fuente's people keep trying to call him, even though they're just looking for him. But they do have some suspicion, right? Right. They think that the calls, those messages, they're trying to say like that Crockett called them back. They're mm -hmm. using that against him as like that's communication between them, even though he never called that lady back. Mm -hmm. So they basically, yeah, that set him up. All that stuff sets him up. Yep. Yep. There's also some interesting conversation here where Jerkface is talking to Sunny. Sunny's freaking out right he's saying this you you have nothing on me i'm just trying to investigate this case kate's is telling sunny i believe you in these conversations and then jerk face floats out there he, he starts talking to sunny starts accusing him of things and castillo steps in and says you need to go through the proper channels you don't talk to my personnel that way and then jerk face floats out there like well three million dollars goes a long way castillo like you uh, share it yeah if yeah you split if you it, it's a lot of money yeah and then Castillo turns to Sonny and says, it's time for you. Can you step out of the office, please? And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> Castillo's going to go fucking samurai oh, on this no. guy. <laughs> I was like, he's going to jump on the ceiling, jump down with a samurai sword. All you hear is one. Psh, he's done. No. <laughs> it is ass whooping time. Yeah, or at least a verbal ass whooping. <laughs> You do not float out there that Castillo is somehow breaking the rules. Yeah. Or he's somehow crooked or and yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> That's why he's a, he's a single lonely man because he follows the rules. <laughs> Sleeping at the precinct. And of course, uh, of course, as soon as they leave, Tubbs and Crockett's answer is, you know, let's go get drunk. <laughs> but first he has to punch Kate. So. Yeah, he punches him real hard right in the face. Kate says, I keep... 
slipping and falling down. <laughs> Kate's is such a dork. He wears like the <laughs> the world's ugliest blazers <laughs> too. <laughs> like something out of a clown show or something. And yeah, and he goes, I, I keep falling down. Darn it, I fell down again. I don't know how I keep doing that. <laughs> well, and this is where Kate gets the chance to pitch his idea. He says that Sonny is going to come to Fuente and say, I have your $3 million, but I'm not just going to give it to you. I have leverage over you now. I want... 50 keys worth of quote unquote pharmaceutical grade cocaine, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> and Fuente Do I need to knows. pull out my chart? Yes. <laughs> Do I need to pull out my chart with the math? 50 keys means nothing to this guy. We're talking Sorry. quarter ton blocks. John's like one of those giant pointers where you extend it out. He's like pulling it out. <laughs> Hits the board. See? Right Three million there. dollars will get you 150 keys. Unless they're going to pay the, the American price of $60,000, then they'll get you 50 keys. But I mean, what are they, chumps? <laughs> Well, the deal here is that Sonny is going to play the continued cro crooked cop, get Fuente to give him drugs for the money, because then to sell it on like that, Sonny can use that to raise more money, and then Fuente will get his cash back. But then this will all be a sting, because then they'll have an opportunity where Fuente will have the drugs on his boat, and then they'll be able to bring down Fuente. Castillo and Tubbs do not like this idea. But it's really the only way that Sonny can get out from up, from underneath the IA investigation and say that it what that he was not involved with the money, or he could wait the investigation out and then. <laughs> but no, we're gonna go this way. <laughs> so later that night, at the bar, like John said, at the bar, Tubbs and Crockett go out to get drunk, and this is where Sonny finally puts it together. Morado said, "Payback." This is Morado's grand plan. That he staged this, somehow staged this out to make it look like Sonny was the one that took the money. Really, Murado was the one that took it, and Murado was now getting his payback. Which, why did it take him so long to figure that out? Like, right when the, I, they started yeah. charging him, or when, or when he said, said payback? Like, <laughs> you know, when Fuente said, like, you took the money, like, he should have caught on right then. Like, isn't he a detective? <laughs> like, really, isn't he a detective? <laughs> Like, he's a detective. He's detective grade. Like, well, how did you get this, Sonny? Did you take the test for real? Up to this point, no no actual police work has been done. <laughs> True. Um, you call Tubbs doing two different accents, not police work. <laughs> Trudy did some police work. We shouldn't see it. It was out in the back somewhere. <laughs> oh, 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 no. That's coming up. That's coming up. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we head back to the precinct that late that night, and Sonny's drunk back in the office. He stumbles on Castillo, who's sleeping on the couch in his office. I know. He's got that beautiful house. Why isn't he home in it? Like, I, I don't remember know. He's got those, those giant open windows and everything. <laughs> but Sonny just gets... I thought he was maybe in like the evidence room or something. You're oh, right. I, it I is like a different room. Yeah, I thought it's not his office. I think it's like the meeting room where they have mm. all the meetings and stuff. But he has like a tissue wad in his hand. Was he crying? <laughs> like he was laying down when he and when he sat is up, Castillo he had a okay? tissue. I don't know. Yeah, is he I don't all right? Know. <laughs> we'll have to check in on Castillo. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but but Marty's definitely a, a, Marty's. A, he's a little annoyed. He's like, "Damn it, Crockett, I was sleeping." <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, and and what, essentially he essentially he tells Crockett, you know, you're too stupid to steal three million dollars. Now go home. You're drunk. <laughs> yeah, he tells him like, "No, I don't. I never." He said, "Do you believe it?" And he's like, "No, I know you're a good cop, basically, mm -hmm. but I ha did what I had to do to protect my the precinct." He did to the the whatever, not the yeah. precinct, but yeah. There, he also and, concedes and says, "You can. I will allow you to go yeah. forward with this plan." He says it, and then as he steps forward, two steps, he shakes his head like a. This stupid, is a, this is, this is stupid. yeah. <laughs> so then the next day, Kate has set up an, an, another meeting with Radolfo. This is where Crockett comes in. He starts crumpling up one hundred dollar bills and throw, like he's throwing them away. He's like, "You better hurry up and make this deal, this deal that Kate had talked about, or I'm going to blow through this three million dollars." So Fuente wants the money. You better hurry up and make this deal. Fifty kilos of cocaine, or he calls it. He think he calls it what Fuente calls it, the weasel. Dust or whatever. Weasel dust. <laughs> Weasel dust. Yes. But and at this point, I'm hoping Fuente just shoots him. <laughs> His only stipulation is that he's going to do business straight with Fuente. They're going to do it face to face. Back. So the next day at the precinct, they're setting up this deal. The first meeting is going to be just a meeting to confirm all the details of the meeting. And then they're going to meet up again with Fuente to deliver the drugs. So this first meeting isn't actually supposed to be the drug exchange. 
it's just supposed to be where Sonny's going to go set up the details with Fuente out on his boat. Like the time where they miraculously escaped last time. That's essentially what this is supposed to be. So now we're going to go to the meet and, and we're going to jump back, back and forth here between the couple different scenes so we're at the final yeah, so moments of this episode at the police station we have Tubbs doing actual police work and we have Trudy being a good secretary <laughs> and handing him files <laughs> that she's already gone through and organized and and put little tabs on and stuff because she's a good secretary she's not an actual <laughs> cop anymore well, i missed earlier where Tubbs had said at the bar when Crockett finally put together what was happening with Morado, that Tubbs had said he asked Trudy to pull together all of the information on everybody that, that's involved in this case. Kate, Fuente, Rodolfo, everybody, anything that's ever happened with this. So I would say that the only two real cops that have been working here are Trudy and Tubbs. Because they're the ones that really put See? this thing together. See, but I differ from you because just that statement about, ha about Crockett having Trudy get together all those files makes me think... Trudy, or he, in Crockett's mind, Tubbs. Trudy is his secretary. <laughs> yeah, in Tubbs' um, mind. Yeah, Tubbs' mind, not Crockett. <laughs> oh, sorry, Tubbs' mind. That Trudy is his secretary, and that he sent her to go find me the files. He, while he's doing the police work, she's standing there, and she's like, holding out files, and this is where it says this. <laughs> the combination of Trudy and Tubbs, if you were to put those two together, they might actually get real police work done. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Are you trying to tell I me that the rest a... don't do real police work? What about Zwitek and Zito? True. But they we... do all the like surveillance stuff. <laughs> okay, so Sunny's the weekly. Encounter. I don't yeah, know. But I, I, keep I can back agree to that. But Gina does a lot of work, and she arrests a lot of people because mm -hmm. her and Trudy work together. <laughs> Tubbs, yeah, okay, yeah. He I think Trudy, Trudy do and a Tubbs, lot of stuff. <laughs> I think Trudy and Tubbs deserve a spinoff because they would actually be a good. It would actually be a police show with them. <laughs> Tubbs then takes it over to Castillo and shows him that Cates was on the boat when the Morado thing happened, where he was suspected of stealing the money. And this is where Tubbs puts it together that Morado didn't steal the money and Cates knew where he took it. Cates is the one that stole the money because he was undercover working the Fuente case. That's how he knows Rodolfo. And that Cates is the one that stole the money. And now Crockett and Cates and Rodolfo are about to head out to Fuente's boat. Crockett is in serious danger. Yes, but he tells him in the slowest way possible. <laughs> like he t puts it all together and then he goes and sits down and looks at the things. And then he goes over there and points it. Like just tell him right away when you walk through the office. And then they could have went and saved Sonny. <laughs> but no, we got to like drag this out. <laughs> out at the boat where... Crockett and Kate's are Kate's rips off the wire that he's wearing so no one can listen in to what's happening and he throws a gigantic bag onto the boat. Sonny sees that while he's being frisked down by Ray Dolfo for guns or anything and you can see he's suspicious of what's happening. They get on the boat and they start heading out to, to Fuente's yacht and I think that someone asked Sonny to get him a beer or something like that. That's why he goes below deck. Yeah, I think it was a drink or something. Yeah. I don't and know. he goes down there and he sees that giant bag that Kate's do on the boat and he opens it up and it's full of cash. Yeah. And that's when he puts together, oh shit, it's Kate's is the one. But on deck, Kate's has already walked up behind Ray Dolfo and shoots and kills him. Mm -hmm. And then there's a scuffle. But 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 why is he for the money with him? He's gotten away with the three million dollars. He set Sonny up. They're on mm -hmm. their way to Fuente where Sonny is about to die, or I'm assuming Kate's is gonna shoot Sonny in the back of the head. Because he was going to take million the boat. On board. Because he was going to take the boat and then go off with the three million dollars. Not a horrible a, it, plan. I'm, I'm not saying it's a stellar <laughs> idea, but we are talking about the man who wears plaid jackets. So, but I think he could easily kill him. Turn the boat around, yeah, exactly. go collect so the why, money, and yeah, drive away. Why bring the money? I don't know, but that's what I think. That's been, what his thought was. He was yeah. going to kill them off and not go to Fuente. Obviously, it could have been very easy away. to stage it like Ray Dolfo was the one that killed Sonny. Yeah, but he didn't think of any of that. This guy's an <laughs> idiot. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> and Sonny's an even bigger idiot that he just put it together. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where well, it were doesn't you? matter because he made a huge mistake. Sonny's a pirate now. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> There's a scuffle. Sonny wins. He shoots Kate's with his gun, with Kate's gun. And then Kate's is left dying. They're out in the middle of the ocean. And Kate says he's sorry that the job got to him, that he got in over his head. He just wanted out. The job got to him. He was done. He couldn't handle it anymore he was going to take the money and run he was going to use sunny as like a patsy so that he could get away with it and he was just he's sorry now and then he says by the way 
because all the money's gone. It like bounced to, to the back of the boat and it blew out the back of the boat. So all the money's gone. The three million dollars is gone. Kate's is gonna die. And Fuente doesn't know anything that's happening other than he's not going to get his money now. So everyone, so he, him and his gang are going to be gunning for Sonny because of Kate's. And then the episode ends. You don't know what yeah. happens with Fuente. You don't know what happens after that. There's a big time drug dealer in Miami now that knows that Crockett and Burnett are the same person. And he doesn't change his so. name after that. <laughs> I just want to reiterate that. He doesn't change his yeah. name. He's still Burnett all the way to the end of Miami Vice. <laughs> can, can, can I throw a, 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 just a little other wrinkle into this? So Sonny has a, a target on his back for the three million dollars that apparently Fuentes cares about. Um, so Fuentes is gunning for Sonny, who has an ex-wife and child living in where Chicago or wherever they moved to Atlanta. Atlanta. Yeah, they're in Atlanta. Yeah. Atlanta. Yeah, right. So, so they're not just gunning for Sonny; they could go after his kid. So, not only that, but how is Sonny, who's being investigated by Internal Affairs, going to explain why he shot Kate's with Kate's gun, who also that which the same gun which killed Rodolfo? Yeah, but he already has the, that. Tubbs and oh, okay. Castillo have figured it out ahead of time. Right, okay. so he's got them to back him up. But they, they don't have, have all that definitive evidence. proof. They have to they don't steal. Have def- proof no, they found out that he was. They found out that Kitts was there when the money was stolen. That's not definitive proof. That's not. We can arrest him now. Well, he's dead. Uh, oh, no, and, <laughs> they ain't arrested him. He's dead. There's no evidence of money. He's dead. I mean, I guess. I, I guess Pirate Sonny could just, you know dump him into the water and drive back. So I guess there wouldn't be a body to prosecute Sonny for. So the murder rap would be hard. He's screwed. I don't see how there's another episode. Sonny's going to be in jail. <laughs> Let's save some of that for our final thoughts. Because I I really like this episode, but there is this is a big pothole at, at, at the end of this episode. But let's first go break down the music of this episode. All right, John. I know in this episode, I, I don't really remember much of the music, but I do know. And Melissa, we had a great moment when Crockett's theme was mm-hmm. played at the end of the episode. What else was in this episode? All right. We're going to start off the song Bass in Trouble by Sly and Robbie. Sly and Robbie has already been fe- featured in the show before and featured yeah. in one of my music segments. So I'm going to kind of say, I'm just going to do a quick refresher and we're going to get through it. Their Jamaican rhythm section and production duo considered two of the most influential reggae artists of all time. I mean, at one point, basically any drum track you heard on a reggae song was probably Sly Dunbar or a takeoff of something Sly Dunbar did. And, and similar with Robbie Shakespeare, he was all over the place in reggae music. Just a few things I might not have covered last time. Sly s- taught himself how to play the drums. His first drum set consisted of empty food cans. Now he that's actually commitment. tried. Yeah, exactly. He first tried regular job as a refrigeration mechanic, but eventually turned his attention to music and never looked back. The two have backed up artists, reggae artists like Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, and Jimmy Cliff, who was also featured in the music segment. They've also worked with non-reggae artists Mick Jagger, Bob Dylan, etc., etc., and even helped pioneer some of the early hip-hop sounds, working with artists in the late 80s, early 90s, such as KRS-One, Queen Latifah, and Young MC. I mean, they're just yeah. I remember just how embodied. much I remember how much of a big deal they were when you talked about them the first time. They just are out a of huge curiosity. Deal. Yeah, yeah, and just out of curiosity, I, I noticed that they were actually still touring. If you are interested in that type of music and you want to go see them, if you are in the Mill Valley, California area, they will be playing at Sweetwater Music Hall on July twenty sixth, nice. uh, two thousand seventeen, and tickets are starting at around $27. So oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. Oh, Perfect no. reason to go dressed in Miami Vice cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's move forward to the next song, Soul Kitchen by X. X is an American punk band formed in 1977, though their sounds are kind of ranged through their through the different years. Some people have even accused them of being a little bit rockabilly. Uh, I want you to stand trial, sir. 
Defend your rockabilly. <laughs> <laughs> they were formed in 77. They're one of the original. They were like in the baby stages of punk. And the band's made up of John Doe, Billy Zoom, Exine, Cervenka, and DJ Bone. Obviously, some of those aren't their actual name, but believe it or not, Bone Break is actually his last name. <laughs> the band got together when John Doe and Billy Zoom, basically they, they, they put together a band, Servinka, who was Doe's girlfriend at the time, and a poet, joined as vocals, and then later Bone Break would join as the drummer. They released seven studio albums, and they have actually a, a big underground following, but they had very little mainstream success. Played through 1980 to 1993, broke up and reunited in the 2000s, and actually currently tour, uh, minus a member or two. Their first album, Los Angeles, and their second album, Wild Gift, are ranked on Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time. So in the mid-80s, Zoom would eventually be replaced by Dave Allen. Alvin, who would, uh, who would perform for an album and then leave himself and eventually be replaced by guitarist Ilky Sun. Mm. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> the most notable thing that they ever did is our stuff that us who aren't into that type of music from that genre is in 1989 they re-released -re their 84 cover of the song wild thing which was used in the movie major league <laughs> a little bit about each of the members doe has also worked as an actor appearing in films Salvador. He also was in Slam Dance in 87, Sugar Town in 99, and I know Melissa loves this movie, Roadhouse in 89. <laughs> you calling me out of my love for old. Roadhouse? <laughs> I love Roadhouse. Yes. <laughs> Billy Zoom now lives in Anaheim and he owns the Billy Zoom Custom Shop in Orange County. So he owns like a Guitar shop, basically, where he makes uh, custom guitars. Bone Break, he's been a career musician. He's played in a few other different punk bands. What I thought was interesting is that aside from playing in other punk bands, he's also heads up to jazz ensembles, Bone Break, Syncopators, and Super String, as well as playing the timpani for the Palisades Orchestra. So, and last but not least, Servinka in 2005, journals and mixed media collages, because she's also a poet and an artist, were ex exhibited in a one-person feature called America the Beautiful. It, it was shown at the San Joaquin Museum of Art and also at the DCKT Contemporary in New York in 06 and was curated by Christine McKenna and Michael Duncan. I wanted to throw their names in there because I'm sure people don't, they don't get much credit for that. Uh, um, <laughs> the strange stuff about Servinka. So she was married to Doe, as I mentioned, that when they formed the band, they were dating. So she was married to Joe from 80 to 85. But she was also married to Vigo Mortensen from 87 to, 80, uh, to 97. Moving on, our next song is Dancing by Chris Isaac. Uh, he's an American rocker from Stockton, California. I, I kind of dig some of Chris Isaac's music. So he's best <laughs> known for his hits, Wicked Game, Baby Did a Bad, Bad Thing, which I like that song. And Somebody's Crying. He's most notably known for his 50s-style crooner sound. And he's also sometimes an actor and closely associated with director David Lynch. Hmm, that's an interesting pair. So David Lynch gave him a... Yeah, yeah. But he, yeah, so David Lynch gave him a role... In uh, the in his Twin Peaks movie, Fire Walk With Me. So mm. Twin Peaks being a show, but there's also some TV movies that they did. He's released 12 studio albums. His first album, Silvertone, in 85, was critically acclaimed, which is why we find him in Vice. Because that goes along with that theme of whatever was hot at the time. So, but his, Chris Isaac's songs, Gone Writing and Living For Your Lover, were featured in Lynch's movie, Blue Velvet. His self-titled album in 85, just scraped into the Billboard Top 100. In 88, his song Suspicion of Love was featured in Married to the Mob with Matthew Modine and Michelle Pfeiffer. Baby Did a Bad Bad Thing was featured in Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut in 1999. If he gets the blessing of Stanley Kubrick, then he's okay in my book. 
Oh, all of a sudden, exactly. you're not making fun of him anymore. <laughs> exactly. See? See? It, one of his songs was in a Stanley Kubrick, and it's the song I like. So <laughs> She also con- composed the theme to the short-lived Late Night with Co- Craig Kilborn. He even had his own show, The Chris Isaac Show, from 2001 to 2004 on Showtime. He guest starred on uh, Friends, too. That's important. Uh, he was Phoebe's boyfriend on the episode. He also made cameo roles in Married to the Mob, Silence of the Lambs. Our last song of the music segment is Three Sisters by In Excess. Wow. You know, this is a deep music segment. I don't remember any of the music when I was watching the episode, but... Chris Isaac, to in excess, excess. Yeah. and then um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on the first band, Flying Robbie. Yeah, Fry and Robbie. Like we're talking like multi platinum, like some of the biggest artists of the '80s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a big episode mm-hmm. of music. Oh yeah, so and this is making up a lot for me because I wasn't a big fan of the episode. Oh, ouch. oh spoiler! No, <laughs> In Excess, being an Australian rock band, formed originally as the Ferris Brothers, and actually, it's composed of composer and keyboardist Andrew Ferris, drummer John Ferris, guitarist Tim Ferris, and guitarist Kurt. Penagilly, uh, Pengilly, and bassist Gary Gary Beers with vocalist Michael Hutchinson. Hutchins. The reason why I brought up that they were originally formed as the Ferris Brothers is that wasn't the that wasn't even the original uh, name. So they started out as Doctor Dolphin, <laughs> then they became Guinness, <laughs> then they became the Ferris Brothers. And then they became in excess <laughs> um, after a chance meeting with Midnight Oil manager Gary Morris. And they were inspired by the ba- the English band XTC and an Australian jam maker IXL. And that's how they came up with the name of the band. Jam maker. Jam is very important in Australia, clearly. <laughs> yes, I thought that was I thought that was hilarious. They would finally achieve international success with albums Listen Like Thieves, Kick, and X. Most notably with songs What You Need, Need You Tonight, which is the one I know the most, Devil Inside, Never Tear Us Apart, and Suicide Blonde. Also familiar with that one. So in the early 90s, they actually got a little bit uh, more success because of a budding romance between Hutchins uh, and Aussie pop artist Kylie Minogue. That is a huge deal. I can't underplay like, how much of a big deal that is. Yeah, she's she's a big pop star. And she's big and she's obviously big in Australia, but worldwide she's dance club music. She's and stuff like, like that in her fifties now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she is smoking hot. Yeah, she's really hot, and she yeah. also is a big deal because she. I'm like really sure she survived breast cancer. Mm-hmm. She was sick for a while and stuff, mm-hmm. and she came back. So yeah, she's a big deal. Now hearing that, I regret not googling her. <laughs> I just I just assumed, oh, she's just some Australian pop star. No, no one cares. <laughs> You probably heard her music because she so, was mm-hmm. popular in the 90s in America for like a, one or two hits. Unfortunately, in 97, Hutchins would be found dead in his hotel suite in Sydney. And the band would not actually publicly perform for a full year after his death. And when they finally did start performing, they would perform with guest singers until eventually John Stevens would fill the role, joining the band in 02 for a tour and a recording session. And then in 2005, they would participate in a reality show called rock stars in excess Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where they would compete they would have a competition to find their new lead singer and the winner would be a canadian named jd fortune jd fortune would assume the role and they would release the album stitch uh he would continue with the band until being replaced in 2010 by irish singer Syrian Gribbon, and the band would eventually retire, though not officially, in 2012. I'm watching as of you. 2000 and I'm watching you, Australia and a- Canada and Ireland. I'm watching you three. You're trying to be sneaky, working with each other, thinking that no one's paying attention. <laughs> We're watching you. You see, you get you're the. As of 2015, the band has sold 50 million records. A couple little side notes: their first U.S. tour was in San Diego in 1983, where they had a whopping 24 patrons show up. <laughs> Ouch! 24 people, entire show. Hey, those 24 um, people got a great show. Yeah, they did. Like, <laughs> dude, and they have a great story for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Like, yes. we saw In Excess before anybody figured it out in America. They have the hip, um, most hipsterous beards with the twirliest mustaches. 
<laughs> oh yeah, dude. I am sure there's somewhere there's a ma- there are 24 people that that are in a bar somewhere telling that same story. And over then they and get over. on their unicycle Ignite. and they ride away into the sunset <laughs> with yes, a bowl of yes. doodles. <laughs> so, so their first U.S. tour, they were at they were just a support band for the Kinks, Stray Cats, and the headliner being Paul and Oates. How does oh, that work? Wow. God. In excess, Hall and Oates, Stray, Stray Cats. Cats. I want to go back in time. I need a time <laughs> machine and I need to go see that show. <laughs> <laughs> How is that even a? How does that tour even get put together? <laughs> they don't really make sense as a tour, really. Like in excess and the Stray Cats together, yeah, that makes sense. The Hall and Oates. So, but yeah, so there is your music. This was a stacked music segment. This was, I mean, the bands that were in here, then the bands that were like associated acts and stuff like that. I'm actually really surprised I didn't remember any of the music, and it might have a bearing on why I like this episode so much because just in the background hearing. The music that was playing just added it to me, even though I wasn't paying that much attention to it. Yeah, and I think most of the music, for the most part, was like, it wasn't like like montage music. It was mostly like background, like when Sonny goes Mm -hmm. to the boat and the music's playing really loud. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't mm-hmm. really pick up on what song was playing. Uh, yeah. That that's how the music was. It was kind of just in the background of what was going on. Let's go over and give our final thoughts on this episode because it sounds like there's a split crowd here. All right, Melissa, I'm going to make you kick off the, me- the the final thoughts section here. What are your final thoughts on this episode? Okay, I like this episode. I didn't remember it when we were discussing what episode we were going to watch. I could not remember for the life of me like <laughs> what happened. I remembered Frank Zappa being in it, and I remember him on the boat, and I remembered the boat scene. <laughs> but <laughs> as soon as the um, entrance, oh, the, the open hit, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a good episode. I like this episode. I like it because uh, it actually shows the downside of them being undercover. And I mean, I know we make jokes about how like he uses the same name over and over again, but really that's his job and he's, he has to build like a character that people are supposed to trust. Mm -hmm. So he does business with all these people and some of them, they do business with them and it don't, they don't get arrested. He just actually does the deals Mm -hmm. and he builds up who he's supposed to be. So I think it's a good, it's a shed light on what it's like to be undercover and do that job. And yes, it gets to them. And yes, they, sometimes they break and do crazy things like steal the money and try and take off and like cover up themselves. Mm-hmm. So it's a good episode. I don't have any problems with it at all. Like I didn't think it was long. I didn't think it dragged. Um, once again, though, Tubbs is not really in this episode that much and not as like, I mean, I know he solves it at the end, but not really like his emotions or anything else. It's just kind of there mm-hmm. like as a sidekick. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say I really like this episode. In fact, it would be a perfect episode if it wasn't for that giant pothole at the end. Because like we don't know what happens with him and Fuente. Now his cover is blown. Like There's all this stuff that gets outed at the very end of the episode, but we don't know. It's just left wide open. And and with it being left wide open, it means that whatever undercover cop he is is now busted. And this show should... This TV show should be over either, or there should be something gigantic that happens in the next episode to change that. Like there's a a continuation of Puente's story that that way they can get to the bottom of it. The only thing that could happen is that we know that Puente was in New Orleans first, and he moved to Miami, so he might move on to greener pastures because he knows that the vice my, that my, my vice is on to him. But otherwise, I love this episode. It hits everything that Vice does well: flashy colors. You see the Ferrari in the beginning, so it's got the fast cars, big yachts, giant house, huge quantities of drugs, like real cocaine cowboys that are bringing things in. A freaking pirate cruising out in international waters to avoid the police. It hits everything that Miami Vice does well. It's just, I, I hope at some point in time they come back and finish off this story. John, what are your final thoughts? I did not like this episode. <laughs> uh, Frank Zappa being a pirate was the only thing that I actually enjoyed. Other than that, I'm getting tired of guest stars coming back to reprise different characters. And the fact that Dan Hedaya had a terrible accent the whole time just made it even worse. <laughs> I, I spoke about it during the episode. None of the math added up. 
um, <laughs> why he would give a crap about three million dollars, how yeah, the stuff, how any of that stuff would work out. Even beyond that, like like you just touched on, this this should be the end of Sonny Crockett's career. This should be he should either be arrested for being a dirty cop, outed and unable to do undercover work moving forward. The the show should not be able to continue with how it ended. And when when I went to watch the episode, I accidentally started the next episode first and I had to jump back so I saw about mm-hmm. 10 seconds. And by, at the end of the episode, all I had was 10 seconds of the of the next episode's open and I realized they're not going to address this at all. Mm. Well, not in the next episode. No. I mean, I get that, but at the same time, like how is this not a to be continued? How is Sonny's <laughs> career not over? How do we have how is his life was there a target on his back and we have no reference of the fact that his family might be in danger uh and then the lack of other of the other vice members really being in this episode they're 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 there a little bit in support but there's no major roles there's nothing no major ub scenes there's no major b squad scenes there's no major trudy or gina scenes they're all just kind of supporting you get a little bit of a little more Castillo, but mostly Sunny. Um, you know. Then on top of all that, I was kind of hoping to get more. Re- I saw Roberto Duran being in it. We only get thirty seconds of him at the beginning before he dies, so he's he's a guest star, but not really. Like I said, outside of Frank Zappa, there was there was nothing that I that I really cared for in this episode because none of it really really gelled together for me. You know, none of it added up. The math did not add up. <laughs> and that bugs me, being a math person. <laughs> What's so funny is you guys keep talking about Frank Zappa being the best part. I thought he was the worst part. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's funny not to me. like a pirate. <laughs> it's funny to me that we swapped sides on this based on the episode yeah, last week. That, is true. that we totally swapped you roles on this me. one. I was so, <laughs> as you can tell, week to week, like... This is why we do the Miami Vice podcast and why it's interesting to see from me and John's perspective who have never seen an episode before and how it changes from week to week and what we expect out of the show and what ones we find that are good and which ones aren't aren't the best. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this episode? Email us, heat at gmail.com. Check out the website, GoWithTheHeat.com. Click on About Us. You can find all the ways that you can contact us and all the ways that you can contact the show. You can also check out the show on Stitcher, iTunes, YouTube, pretty much anywhere there's podcasts. Tune in. Anywhere you can catch podcasts, you can find this show. So if, if you want to share it around, make sure you give a review on your platform of choice. Go ahead and rate the show. That way more people can find it. We hope you enjoy this episode and we'll see y'all next time. Bye, pals. Thank you.